Welcome to the Lightroom Classic Masterclass, a video series in which I will go through all the editing tools Lightroom has to offer and explain them in detail. New videos will be uploaded weekly and for better navigation you can find all of them in the separate Lightroom Masterclass playlist. You can follow along this video by downloading the raw file from the link in the description of the video. In this workshop, let's take a look at the basic adjustments. First, click on the title to expand the panel. With these settings, we will mainly set up the white balance and exposure, but also assign a profile and add details to our photo. The first step in my workflow is to change the profile. Keep in mind, these profiles are only visible to you if you're shooting in RAW. When editing a JPEG, you won't be able to set up the profile. Now, there is nothing wrong with the preset Adobe color profile, but most of the times, other profiles help getting the photo to a better starting point. Click on Adobe color to reveal the drop-down menu. Going through this list, you will see each profile has a slightly different look. They are affecting the color as well as the contrast of an image. I usually want to have a very flat base image to start working on. For that purpose, Adobe Neutral or Adobe Standard are perfect. They reduce overall contrast and color and thus give you more control to adjust those parameters manually. Another one of my favorites is Adobe Landscape which actually will increase the base saturation and therefore is perfect if I want to create a vibrant photo like I want to in this case. There are many more profiles you can check out behind the browse button. Most of them, besides the Adobe RAW profiles, will more heavily alter the image. So just be aware of that. By adjusting the amount slider, you can regulate the strength of the chosen profile. Sadly, this slider doesn't work for all those Adobe RAW profiles, however. And one more thing I want to add, you can mark a profile as a favorite and thus make it appear in the profiles drop-down menu. And to do that, simply click on that star icon in the upper right corner. Let's set up the white balance. This tool is generally used to correct color casts and make white objects, for example snow, appear to be white. That's the name white balance. However, depending on your style and preferences, that's not always what you want. First, let us try to set the correct white balance for this photo. Open up the drop-down menu and change the settings from as shot to auto. Lightroom then tries to automatically adjust temperature and tint to get the correct white balance. This works surprisingly well in a lot of cases. You can also choose from different white balance presets for different situations, like daylight, clouds or flash. These are settings you will most likely find in your camera as well, but they probably won't get you 100% correct results. The most precise way to set up the white balance is the white balance selector tool. Click on the little eyedropper tool and hover over the image. You will see a small window appear with a zoomed in area of the image you are hovering above. This window tells you to pick a neutral color. To help you find a neutral color, in the bottom of the window you see the red, green and blue values of the pixel you are currently hovering above. Neutral or gray means red, green and blue have in theory the exact same value. In practice, however, it's good enough if those RGB values are close to each other. A good area to look for neutral or gray spots are clouds. As mentioned earlier, depending on how you want the photo to look like, a perfectly set white balance is not required. This scene, for example, would look great with slightly exaggerated warm lights to make it look like it was shot during golden hour. All we need to do is to bring up the temperature slider until we are happy with the look. Playing around with the temperature might reveal unwanted colors in the green to magenta spectrum. So making use of the tint slider helps you to fix that. In this case, you can see a sub green color cast, so I'm going to raise the tint slider and thus I'm fixing that. Let's jump into the tone settings. These regulate the brightness and contrast of an image. In order to get the best results working on these sliders, it is vital to understand the histogram. 
The histogram is a graph that measures the brightness of an image by representing the frequency of each tone as a value on a bar chart. Starting on the left side, we have pure black, going through shadows, midtones, highlights, all the way up to the brightest pure white tones on the right side. When we are talking about under or overexposure, that means the histogram is clipping on the left or the right side and we are losing details in either the dark or the bright areas. This is indicated by the arrows in the upper right corner. Clicking on them makes the clipped areas visible. In general, this is something we want to prevent. But as always, it's not a rule that is set in stone. Sometimes having a bit of under or overexposure present can help getting a better photo. For a well-exposed image, the histogram is usually spread out nicely over the whole horizontal axis, meaning the photo includes tones from the darkest darks to the brightest brights and all in between. Now, how do we set up the tones for this photo? The light that day was great and I want to make it stand out a little more. This means by increasing contrast, we can make the shot more dramatic. The first step here is to make everything darker. And for that, let's drop the exposure. As you bring the slider down, watch how the histogram graph changes. At some point, we can even see underexposure kicking in. Don't worry about that, we can fix that later. For now, we want to focus on the bright areas. To do that, bring up the highlights. As you do this, you can see how we are nicely spreading the histogram and thus we are adding more contrast. To further improve this, let's push the whites. At this point, we are starting to get overexposure in the snowy patch in the center. But as I said, sometimes overexposure isn't that bad and we are not losing any vital information in the snow. Holding down the Alt key while raising the white sliders also makes that visible. Now that we have adjusted the brighter tones using highlights and whites, we improved the contrast a lot. But we can improve it even further by adjusting shadows and blacks. Continue by bringing down the shadows. This will make those darker parts just a little darker. This looks great, but at that point the underexposure might be a bit too much. What can we do to fix that? Simply raise the blacks and that will make the darkest parts brighter. Again, you can hold down the Alt key while adjusting the black slider to make those underexposed areas visible. At this point, we have a solid, contrast-rich base image to work with. You might be wondering why I didn't use the contrast slider. That's because using the general contrast, you don't have as much control over it as with the other sliders and you most likely end up with a not so good looking image. Finally, there's the auto button, a tool which I rarely use but still want to include in this video. Clicking on it, Lightroom tries to adjust the tone sliders automatically and the results are often rather bright shots without any depth, but it might give you an idea for further adjustments. The last chapter of this video will be about the presence settings. These are great to add detail, depth and colors to the base photo. But be careful, all of those sliders are extremely powerful and quickly overdone. Starting with texture, this slider adds fine detail to an image, almost like sharpening. I use it on pretty much all the shots I added, but I rarely go above 15. Going higher makes the photo look like a grungy HDR scene from a decade ago, so we don't want that. Clarity is great to add depth and clearness. In my experience, it works perfect on mountain landscapes, but it can also be used to add a soft, almost autumn glow-like effect by using negative amounts of clarity. Perfect for a dreamy scene. The same goes for dehaze. As the name suggests, its intention is for reducing haze and it works quite well when used in subtle amounts. But I personally love reducing the dehaze amount to add artificial fog or glow to an image. With the last two sliders, vibrance and saturation, we can control the photo's color strength. Bringing up those sliders will make colors more intense. Usually adding a bit of vibrance after working on the tone adjustments is a good idea. 
but keep in mind you can target specific colors later in the editing process for a more pleasing result. And again, I want to point out to be careful with the saturation slider since this one is a little stronger than Vibrance and oftentimes overdoing this slider will make your image look quite strange. Bringing down these sliders will of course turn your image into a black and white shot. If that is your goal, I would suggest to simply switch the treatment going from color to black and white. And that's about it for the first masterclass video about the basic stuff. In next week's video, we will be talking about masking. So if you want to get updated, make sure to subscribe to this channel and maybe click the bell icon. I hope you did enjoy this video and learned something new. If you have any questions, feel free to ask in the comments and thank you very much for watching this video.